Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, November 19th, 2015. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord, Savior, our King, Jesus Christ. Just got back from Washington, D.C., where I had the good pleasure of meeting with our congressman, talking to him in depth about all kinds of issues, uh, the Syrian refugees, Obama, um, the Paris attacks, Islam, all kinds of things. I got to sit in on the Congress and the House of Representatives as they debated these Syrian refugees, as they talked about the safety of our country. I heard arguments from both sides personally as I sat there and saw the rooms where I've been watching from C-SPAN and you know where you see them on TV speaking from. It was amazing. And what was really cool is I heard people invoking the Bible on both sides of the argument. Some people saying, you know, well, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you didn't clothe me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me water to drink. You didn't give me a place to live. People arguing to allow these refugees into our country, despite the fact that we know that Muslim terrorists that seek our death, that seek our destruction, are trying to slip in with these refugees. Some of them were arguing that it takes a year and a half for refugees to be processed into America, which I don't believe at all. Others saying, oh, they're going to find another way to come in. They seek our death. They seek to destroy us. Now listen, I want to make sure I'm very clear on this. I'm all about helping out those who need help, those who are true refugees, who are truly seeking a better way of life for their family, for their children, that are seeking you know, food, water, shelter, uh, a job, a, a way to make a living. I'm all for supporting those because when you think about it, America is filled with refugees. I mean, most most of us have ancestors that came from other countries, you know, pretty much all except the Native American Indians, which I also have some of that blood in me. Um, but we left Great Britain for a better way of life seeking to find a place where we won't, weren't overtaxed and underrepresented, seeking to find a place where we could worship, where we could live, where we would have a better way of life. And I'm all for letting people who are truly seeking that to come to America. If they will abide by our laws and agree with our democratic lifestyle and not try to change our country into being the kind of place that they left, there's a reason they left. And it's interesting to watch the arguments. Watching people in Congress, in the House, talking about, no, we shouldn't let any of these people in, or we should have some kind of screening process so that we don't have these kind of killers that were infiltrating Paris and causing these attacks because people understand something. Islam seeks to kill everyone that doesn't believe the way they do. It's part of their ideology. If you don't believe the way Muslims believe, they will seek your death or they will seek to charge you outrageous uh, jizya, a tax for protection, um, and you will be less than a full citizen under their laws, under their way of life, under Sharia. There's a war going on. Islam has declared war on the world. Here's a story out of Fox News. Obama threatens to veto a House GOP bill on Syrian refugee screening. Here's our Muslim president saying, yeah, come on, hundreds of thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees. Come on, we don't have to screen you. We don't have to check you out. We don't have to see if maybe you're some kind of terrorist working for ISIS. Just come on in. Not only is that ignorant, but that could cause some serious harm in America. That could cause a lot of destruction. That could cause a lot of good, Bible-believing, God-fearing people to be killed. Could cause atheists, homosexuals, all kinds of people to be killed because Muslims don't agree with American lifestyle. They don't agree with democracy. You see, Sharia is not a democracy. Islam and democracy cannot exist together. Obama threatened to veto legislation aimed at improving screening for Syrian refugees. What's his intention? To let all his Muslim brothers come pouring into America so they can take us down from within. That's his intention. 
not wanting to do any checks, any background checks on any of these people, just bringing in hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees. You think a few terrorists might come in through there? You think there might be some that seek our destruction, that seek our way of life to be totally destroyed? I say no to this. There's a lot of people in, in Washington saying no to this. Ted Cruz has called for Obama to be arrested. I fully agree with that, and I completely support that. This is America, and we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our borders and not let these people that seek our death and destruction and to seek to stop our way of life, we don't need to let them in here. We do need to let those in who are seeking true asylum, who are seeking a better way of life, who are seeking all the wonderful things that America has to offer without seeking our death, without seeking our destruction, without trying to destroy America. I'm all for letting all the people in that will love America for who she is. Because Islam has declared war on the world. Pretty clear. Um, I think it's time to acknowledge this and to respond in the right way. I think it's time to start calling Islamic terrorism what it truly is. We need to elect a president and leaders who will take the fight to the Islamic State because they're bringing the fight to us and it seems we don't have the leadership to respond with any kind of force. Russia, France, Germany, they're seeking to destroy ISIS, Islam. What are we doing? Oh, Obama's claiming we're bombing them, but are we really? Vladimir Putin has said, oh, Obama's lying to Americans and the rest of the world. He's not doing anything against ISIS. He's got people there on the ground reporting things that they've seen there. I think the Paris attacks have changed a lot of things. It just about <laughs> drove me crazy that I couldn't make any videos while all of this was going on. I was in Washington, D.C. while ISIS was claiming they were going to strike Washington, D.C. And I talked with my kids, with my wife. We talked about it. I said, hey, are you guys afraid? Do you have any fear? You know, we're not to live in fear. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It was a good moment for me to make it into a teaching moment, to use the Bible to show them that we're not going to be afraid of man, no matter who they are, no matter what they do. And I'm tired of this world making apologies for Islam. I'm tired of them saying it's the religion of peace when every time you see these terrorist attacks, it's from Muslims. There's no peace in them, and it's easy to understand why there's no peace. It's because they don't know the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior, and King, the Son of God, God in flesh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah that was prophesied. They don't know him. You see, I've read the Quran. I've read the entire Quran. They deny Christ. They deny he's the Son of God. They deny he died on the cross. They deny he rose again from the dead. They deny everything about Jesus. They have a twisted, perverted version of Isa, their version of Jesus, who's not the Son of God. That's just what Satan does. You know, when Satan tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, he quoted scripture, but he misquoted it. He twisted it just enough to pervert it a little bit. That's what the Quran has done because they're following after Satan. They claim they're not, but that was Satan in that cave that tricked that fool Muhammad into thinking he was the angel Gabriel. And I say fool because Muhammad didn't know Jesus either. So yes, he was a fool, not my brother. So don't quote what Jesus said. Don't call your brother fool because he's not my brother. He didn't know Jesus. Okay? Muhammad couldn't read or write. So not only was he a fool, he was illiterate, which further suggest that fool is a great title for him. That's why Paul or, or Paul told us in Galatians, if we or an angel from heaven come to you with any other gospel than the one of Jesus we taught you about, may they be forever cursed. That's why Jesus said in John 3.18, those who do not believe in the only begotten Son of God are condemned already. That's why Jesus told us in John 16, there are those who will kill you thinking they're serving God, but they don't know the Father nor me. That's why the Bible warns us of these things. People understand this. Islam is Antichrist by nature. They're serving Satan. 
in the Muslim Islamic ideology, they believe this Mahdi, this 12th Imam, will come back along with Isa, their version of Jesus, and will kill all the Jews and all the Christians. Now understand something. Even though this is a twisted viewpoint, it's actually true. But the one that's going to be doing this will be the Antichrist and the false prophet the Bible speaks of. And millions will follow after him, the Bible says. Guess what? Most of them will be Muslim. So understand this. They're serving Satan, and they don't even know it. But if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're condemned already, Jesus said. You see, this is where it comes into play, where Jesus told us to pray for our enemies. Our prayer should be that their eyes are open to the light of truth, that they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the real Jesus, the true Jesus, the one who died on the cross to save us, the one who rose again from the dead, the one who is the Son of God, the one who is God in flesh. Oh, people, this... This is a battle that goes beyond flesh and blood, just like Paul told us in Ephesians 6. But against spirits and principalities and wickedness in high places. I think today you can see more wickedness in high places than ever before. The presidency, the papacy of the Pope. There is spiritual wickedness in high places all over this world today. People need to understand Islam is not the religion of peace. They're the religion of destruction and death for those who oppose them, for those who don't believe their twisted, wrongful ideology. It's time to stop making excuses for Islam. It's time to stop calling them the religion of peace because they're not. It's time to cause, call it what it is. It's time to step up and speak truth. How the Jerusalem Post, Benjamin Netanyahu from Israel, Prime Minister of Israel, says Paris terrorists are beasts who have a name, radical Islam. Why don't you call them what they are? That's the kind of leadership that needs to stand up. He said, stand together in the struggle to defeat these beasts who have a name, radical Islam. We must stand and fight together. The people of Israel grieve with you, France. The people of Israel stand with you. Isn't that interesting? I just want a leadership who will say ISIS is Islamic and Bruce Jenner's a man, okay? Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. <laughs> the American left claims that ISIS is even Islamic, which is the most ridiculous, incredibly ignorant thing I've ever heard. Saying Bruce Jenner's a woman, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I think only a bigot would think a man with a penis is a man when he claims to be a woman. Sorry, I hate to be so graphic, but how about we call things what they are? I don't care what you self-identify as. Let's call things what they truly are. I think it's time to do so. Um, I heard where the ringleader of the Paris massacre has been tracked down and killed. Um interesting that they even knew who he was and found him. I, I'm always amazed at the, the work FBI and these investigators come up with because you have to stop and think, man, what kind of clues did they find? How did they follow this? I mean, I, I haven't read all the stories as to how they caught this guy, but apparently they killed him in France. Uh, France is having all kinds of difficult issues with allowing people to preach the word. Um, you know, God told us in his word in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his service. So what's happening in France, we hope and pray will be used for the providence of God in his sovereignty to open the hearts of the people to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God is moving in France and Satan hates this. Satan hates to see any kind of movement that goes against him. Um, there are more people preaching the gospel in France these days than there has been in hundreds of years. 
I think Satan hates that. I think he'll do everything he can to stop the word from going forth because that's what he does. That's what he does, people. And I just wish more people would understand the kind of war we're in. And it's time to suit up and put on the full armor of God and engage in this battle. Um, out of the Jerusalem Post, Netanyahu says, the Islamic movement seeks to replace Israel with a caliphate. And again, he said, we have nothing against the Muslim citizens of Israel, but we will continue to act against those who incite hatred and those who encourage terrorism. We'll continue to act against them. Um, he said, Muslim citizens of Israel enjoy full equal rights. And most of them are law-abiding citizens, but we will fight against those who encourage terrorism. We will seek to destroy those who seek to destroy us. I like it when people call truth truth and when people speak what something truly is instead of sidestepping the issue, instead of doing anything they can to change it into something else. That strike in Paris, just another assault around the world. Um, Islam declaring war against the world. They're saying they'll do this anywhere. They're seeking to do it in Washington. They've come out with a video saying they're going to bring it to New York. They're going to fight all over the world those who don't agree with their twisted ideology, with their wrongful way of life. They're required in the Quran, in Surah 2, 190 through 192, they're required to defend Islam. You see, that's another way Islam is different from Christianity. I don't have to defend my God. He'll defend himself. I don't have to kill someone who speaks against Jesus Christ. I pray for them. I pray that their blind eyes will be open, that they'll come out of the darkness and into the light of truth. I pray that they will know my Lord and Savior and they won't end up in eternal hell where their false prophet Muhammad is burning. Yeah, I said that. And I'll continue to speak the truth, especially the word of God. Hmm. You know, we can expect more and more attacks like this. I hate to say it, but they're coming in greater numbers, in greater intensity, greater frequency, and bigger numbers of people will die in these attacks. Not trying to scare you. Just trying to tell you what's going to happen. And I'm not some kind of prophet. I'm not a, a fortune teller. But I know what the word of God says. In Revelation, it says the Antichrist makes war against the saints and overcomes them. Okay. So, hate to say it, but we can expect these kind of things to happen. We can expect this. But you know what? To live is Christ. To die is gain, Paul said. And I... I'm learning more and more what that means every day. So how do we respond to this kind of thing? How do we react? First and foremost, these kind of attacks in Paris show us that no one is promised tomorrow. Okay? None of us are. Me and my whole family could have been killed in Washington. Nobody knows. We need to make every opportunity. Uh, in Ephesians 5, um... Ephesians 5, in, in verse 16, it says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. What happened in France could happen anywhere. It could happen in America. I saw where, um, wait, I think it's a story I've got coming up, where Syrian Muslim terrorists were detained at the Texas border. We need to... Give this day the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 18 speaks about um, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for the things under God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. We need to live and serve in God's power, for God's glory, seeking to lead the lost into the light of truth, seeking... <laughs> There's so much to do. There's so much to do. 
We need to pray for these Muslims. We need to pray for all our non-Christian friends and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with them because everyone deserves to hear the gospel before it's too late. We need to live each day as if we're going to meet Jesus today because one day we will. This spread of jihad, this spread of Islamic violence shows, I think, that Satan is threatened by the advance of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Radical Islam has come up at a time when more Muslims have come to Christ than ever before in Islamic history. More Muslims have come to Christ in the last three years than they have in the last 1900 years. Okay, 1400 years, sorry. I understand that. Paris has been attacked at a time when the church in France is experiencing this remarkable resurgence. There's a, a real revival at work in this secular nation. So the enemy of God will attack the children of God. And we need to refuse to be afraid. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The he in you is the Holy Spirit. The he in the world is Satan himself. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So we need to pray for our enemies. Pray that they'll come to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and King that he is. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Netanyahu says, A strong Israel is the main stopgap against Mideast collapse. He spoke at a Jerusalem post-diplomatic conference in Jerusalem. Netanyahu said, A strong, democratic Israel is one of the main stopgaps against the collapse of the Middle East. Israel is the most important and the strongest bastion against radical Islam in the region, he said. Not the cause, the obstacle. Israel is a shining light in a sea of darkness in the Middle East. Sadly, most people in the world don't understand that, including most of the leadership here in America. I take that back. I don't say most. Most of the ones at the top of the leadership in America, because I saw a lot of congressmen, a lot of senators that are God-fearing, Bible-believing people. And my trip to Washington gave me just a little glimmer of hope that there are those who know the truth in the leadership positions in this country. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Bennett calls for ground troops to fight ISIS. Ground troops. Naftali Bennett called for ground troops in Syria to fight the Islamic State. He said the world is not committed enough to fighting ISIS and asserted that drones and a few missiles aren't enough to defeat the terror group. He said the world needs to go on the offensive. The world, not America, not Europe, not Russia, the world needs to go on the offensive. Let me tell you something, people. This is our sword of truth, the Holy Bible. Are you armed for battle? Are you prepared? Ah, how the Jerusalem Post. Analyst says, despite recent attack, the EU unlikely to support Israeli anti-terror measures. Isn't it funny that the world will support France's anti-terror measures? They'll support America's anti-terror measures. They'll support Russia's anti-terror measures, but not Israel's. Who are you to defend yourselves when most of the world wants them destroyed? The Bible tells us the whole world comes against Israel. We're seeing that so much now, more and more than ever before. It's amazing to me. Here's this story out of Breitbart, exclusive, confirmed. Eight Syrians caught at Texas border in Laredo. Two federal agents operating under the umbrella of U.S. Customs and Border Protection are claiming that eight Syrian illegal aliens attempted to enter Texas from Mexico in the Laredo section. They're not only coming to America, people. They're here already. They're here already. And again, I don't tell you this to scare you. I tell you this to strengthen you. Because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, verse... 7 says, is that, is that right? I, 
I'm so pumped up, I, I, I can't even seem to think straight. It's, it's amazing to me what the world calls good and uh, how they turn from the truth and accept these myths and fables and they, they surround themselves with false teachers that just tickle their ears with what they want to hear. The Bible told us these things would happen. Paul told us in Timothy that people would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They'd be lovers of themselves. And we're seeing so much Bible prophecy coming to pass in our day and age. It's just amazing to me. In Luke 6, Luke 6, verse 23, Jesus said, Rejoice you in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Rejoicing in the persecution. Rejoicing in the persecution. Um, Luke 6, 22. This parallels Jesus' teaching in Matthew uh, 5, verse 12, about how we should respond when persecution comes our way. He doesn't say to accept it or receive it gracefully. He seems to go out of his way to let us know that we should be glad and rejoice by leaping for joy when we receive this kind of treatment. You know, some people would say, yeah, I think Jesus kind of went over the top there. He was a little over enthusiastic about that. Um, rejoice. The persecuted disciples of Jesus Christ are going to receive a great reward in heaven according to the word. We're going to be in the company of the prophets of old who also received the same kind of treatment for enduring this persecution. But can you really, can you really jump for joy in the face of persecution? I heard about this pastor, Richard Wormbrand. He was in a Romanian prison and he endured months of torture and isolation. He meditated on scripture and he made an application of the word. He danced. He danced so much in this little cell, leaping and dancing like a crazy person. And the first time he did it, the guard thought he really lost his mind. It was one of the guard's duties to watch for signs that a prisoner's mind was starting to crack under the strain of imprisonment. And this prisoner would be of no more use for questioning. So the guard grabbed his canteen. He came back with his big piece of bread and, and some cheese and some sugar. This broke the rule that the guard was supposed to follow. See? So he tried to, to soothe this crazy, dancing, laughing madman. And Richard took the food. He was very grateful. He took the bread, more than he had had in a whole week. He wrote a book about it in God's Underground, talking about the way he reacted to this persecution with great joy, with rejoicing, with dancing. <laughs> I think he received a reward on earth as well as in heaven. So we need to respond even when we're mildly persecuted because Jesus is rejoicing and you will receive a reward in heaven. So understand that. Um, if you don't have a church home, let me just suggest that you find one, that you get involved, that you come to understand that God has a plan for you. In John 14, verse three, Jesus said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. God has prepared a place for you, a mansion in verse two. In my father's house are many mansions. So if you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, you know this, you understand your destiny. Jesus came to earth, he, he died on the cross, rose again so that we can have everlasting joy and peace in heaven. Let not your hearts be troubled, he said, John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's awesome, that where I am, you may be also. God created a, a spiritual home on earth for, for you, for me. It's the church. In Matthew 16, um, Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Some people, I think, misunderstand that verse and think that 
Christ built his church upon Peter. I think Jesus probably did one of the first chest pumps upon this rock because Christ is the rock, our church, our faith, our hope is built upon. It's not built upon Peter. It's built upon Christ. Okay? You need to experience the, the fellowship in the family of God known as his church. Now, the church isn't a, a building of sticks and bricks. It's the body of Christ, the believers of Christ. But I think it's good to go worship with other like-minded believers in a setting of a church. You now, you may have to go through many churches before you find one that's an actual Bible-believing, God-fearing church. But what is the church? In Colossians 1, verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The church. People who at church, they, they, they think of a kind of building. But Christ said something about the church. You can have a more complete understanding that's from a biblical perspective. You know, when Jesus said that in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He had something in mind greater than some kind of architectural structure. You know, he was referring to the whole body of Christ, which is made up of all believers worldwide. Everyone who's trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior and accepted him as their personal Savior and have become a joint heir with Christ, a, a child of, of God. The church began on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and anointed that group of Jesus' followers in Acts 2. And it will continue until Christ returns. The church isn't just some place for social interaction or fellowship. Even though these are important parts of the ministry, the church is the entire body of Christ, both corporately and individually filled and enabled by the Holy Spirit to carry out the task that God has given each and every one of us, designated by Jesus Christ himself. The whole church, the purpose of the church, is to bring people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to make disciples, instructing them and growing them up in all the things of God, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the Great Commission, go ye therefore into all nations, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. So we need to be responsible to be obedient. In Psalm 93, verse 2, it says, Thou art from everlasting. Christ is everlasting. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. Jesus was is and will always be Lord and Savior. Him which is, which was, which was to come, Jesus said to John on the island of Patmos. Eternal life is only through Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't dead. He's seated at the Lord, at the right hand of God the Father. He liveth forever to make intercession for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me, John 14, 6. So we need to stand strong in this battle. Understanding the living Savior loves you. He died to save you. And he is the only way. We need to make sure the good news of the gospel goes forth, that people see the light of truth. In Mark 10, 21, then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Scripture makes special mention of Jesus loving this rich young ruler. This was said after the, the young man said he had kept all of God's commandments, which wasn't the truth, by the way. Jesus was showing him he had broken the very first commandment that says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Exodus 20, verse 3. And also the 10th commandment that says, Thou shalt not covet it, or covet, Exodus 20, verse 17. You know, Jesus had some tough answers for this guy. You know, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor. This wasn't intended to hurt this man. It was said from a heart of love and intended for his own good. See, the man's money had become his God, as is the case of many today. And it had to be dethroned 
before Jesus could become Lord and take rightful place as Lord and Savior and King. One thing this young man lacked was faith in Jesus Christ as his Savior. This, this young guy was trusting in his goodness and his riches and not in the salvation that Jesus offered as a gift. Sadly, millions, if not billions of people are making the same mistake today. They think their works or that killing Christians and Jews are going to earn them a place in paradise where virgins await. Let me just remind you, there's no virgins waiting for anyone in heaven. You think God's going to allow fornication in his perfect kingdom? Too many people trust in themselves today instead of God. Jesus only came to save sinners. And unless someone acknowledges and admits and confesses that they're a sinner, they can't be saved. The whole world is guilty before God, but he provided a way of salvation for everyone. Through the cross where Jesus died and all the sins of the world were heaped upon Jesus. That's why God turned his back away from Jesus because he couldn't look upon sin and all the sins of the world were placed on Christ on that cross. In the same way, the righteousness of Christ covers those who've accepted his sacrifice as everything needed for our salvation. Everyone is guilty. Everyone's also been freely justified by the grace of God who've accepted Jesus. That doesn't mean everyone's saved. You know, everyone has had this sacrificial offering of Jesus made for their sins by grace, but grace alone doesn't save. We have to put faith and what God has provided for us by grace. And even though the price for all the sins of the world have been paid, only those who receive it by faith are going to benefit from the salvation that only Jesus can offer. You see, Islam can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. The Pope can't save you. Hinduism can't save you. Buddhism can't save you. Scientology cannot save you. The world can't save you. Obama can't save you. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can save you. And that's the message I bring to the world. That's the good news of the gospel, people. I love you guys. I missed you. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.